I don't really feel like I need to introduce you, um, but in Silicon Valley, your name is synonymous with Uber, and to the rest of the world, you are better known as the 2008 campaign manager for Barack Obama, a senior advisor to the president inside the White House, and the author of a best-selling book, <laughs> The Audacity to Win. Um, it's really excited to have you here. When we met in San Francisco, uh, I was a little surprised you admitted that you don't take Uber everywhere. Um, how'd you get here to Red Hook? Well, I take Uber most places. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I think part of the, I think there's a misperception a little bit that, um, you know, it's a choice between Uber and Lyft and public transportation or taxi. And generally, so if I'm in a city, when I was in Chicago a couple weeks ago, I come out of Chicago sometimes and have to go to the city hall, I'm going to take a taxi because it's easier for me at that point to put up my hand and get a taxi. So I think that um, there was a missing uh, part of our transportation ecosystem and ride sharing, I think, becomes an important part of that. But did you take an Uber today? I take Ubers usually in New York, although um, I'll probably take a subway later today and I'll take a taxi maybe tomorrow to the train station. I took a taxi, but I ordered it through Uber, so split the difference. Right. Yeah. Um, I wanted to know also, we know that Travis Kalanick drives passengers around. Have you done this yet? Gotten my I have not driven. Something I'd like to do. Do you, as a company, think there is like an ideal Uber driver? Do you have in mind sort of an ideal use of the platform for work? No, that's one of, I think, the interesting things about the platform. So my, before I came to Uber, I was a heavy user, usually in Washington when I traveled. And so we're getting a picture that, well, it's interesting that the drivers, particularly month after month, you know, in the very beginning, people who have professional driving history tend to gravitate to the platform, but then it diversifies over time. So no, that's the great thing about it. Um, you know, some of our fastest growing demographics in terms of drivers are stay-at-home parents, retirees. Uh, you know, in China, where very much like the U.S., uh, most of our drivers are using it to augment existing income. They have other jobs, uh, heavily middle class. So there is no one uh, Uber driver. And basically, the regulatory system that existed before, and this is something I learned after I came to the company, in most cities around the world, it limited the number of people who could drive. They put a cap on it. And it had a perver two perverse impacts. One is something pretty much, something almost all of us can do is drive. We are severely limiting the number of people who could gain work and money doing that. And secondly, we we're forcing people into car ownership because it was just too hard to get around. So that's one of the great things about the platform is, and again, you can work whenever you want. You can work two hours a week, two hours a day. You can do it for two weeks, you can do it for two months. Whenever you need a little bit of extra work, a little bit of extra money. Let me understand, though, a majority of people are using this for sort of supplemental income rather than as full-time drivers. In the United States, yes. So in the United States, I think about 60% of our drivers nationally uh, drive under 10 hours a week. Uh, in some cities, it's even higher than like that. In Chicago, it is. In Miami, it is. Uh, in China, it's very much like that. Then there's places around the world, Mexico City, where 50% of our drivers were most recently unemployed, uh, skews more full-time. Uh, India it skews more full time. So it depends on the country. Um, but our goal is that whether you, if you do it 40 hours a week for four years, or you do it four hours a week for four months, we want it to be a good opportunity for you. Okay, and you landed in Silicon Valley, coming out of politics to a company that is not without its political involvement. Why did you make that jump? Right, I was hoping to leave politics, but I've come to Uber after all, so I'm surrounded by politics every day. Well, for me, it was very, first of all, um, you know, I was done with politics. So the, the Barack Obama experience for me was very personal. I'd had a career in politics, but that was kind of the capstone. I don't think you do particularly well at things when you're a mercenary. So, you know, I was all in. I was bleeding Obama blue. And I wasn't going to go off and do something else for someone else. I, I hope the person who's running, whose headquarters is down the street from here in Brooklyn, Brooklyn is our 45th president. Very important election. But I was done with politics. Um, and at my advanced age, I really wanted to learn new things. And I'm learning things still every day, almost two years into Uber. Uh, particularly what we do is, is similar in, 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 part, in, in, you know, push a button and get a ride, push a button and get work. But there's distinctions in different countries. So I, th I think I'm really learning a, a lot about the world in a gritty way. And I believed in the mission. Because when I was in the White House, the most frustrating economic debate was, what are we going to do about wage stagnation? Okay? And what you're starting to see is in the sharing economies on scale, a lot of people are able to piece together some income that puts them into a more secure situation, right? So somebody lives in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, a mayor, let's see, there's a couple, they have two kids, they make $48,000 a year. 
That really hasn't changed much throughout the last decade, so they're not feeling much more secure economically. One of them drives on a platform like ours, you know, eight, 10 hours a week, and they go from 48,000 to 58,000. And that's like a small miracle to the family. So I believed in the mission of trying to create more work for more people in a way that's flexible that they work around the rest of their lives. Okay, that mission sounds very noble. Um, but critics have blasted Uber for this, I don't know, classic Silicon Valley approach of ask forgiveness, not permission. There are a lot of very valid criticisms out there, and I'm wondering, from your vantage, what does the company need to change? Right. Well, it's interesting. So yeah, I'm a, a new resident out uh, on the West Coast, and I love the optimism compared to Washington. It's so tangible, so tangible. Uh, the first instinct is not no. The first instinct is yes. But yes, yeah, so every company out there says they're changing the world, and you have to understand most of them are businesses first and foremost, as are we. But there's a lot of interesting societal byproducts that come from what we do. So I think, listen, for the most part, um, what Uber did is doing, and what Lyft is doing and other companies like it, most regulations didn't envision cell phone technology, GPS, apps to provide transportation and a two-sided marketplace. So this was new technology and a new approach butting up with, in some cases, decades old regulation. That debate has really changed now. I think you've seen all around the world new laws passed. So it wasn't ever going to work to say, how do we fit what you do into a 50-year-old taxi law? That's never been a satisfying conversation for anybody. But now what you're starting to see is government say, OK, we understand. We want to create a new regulatory structure, a new legal structure. So again, I think there's a misperception out there that, that Uber and companies like it don't want to be regulated. Uh, we we uh, agree with regulation that's more modern and understands who we are and who we're not. And so all across the United States, in Australia, in Canada, Toronto and Miami most recently last week, uh, in India, in the Philippines, you've seen progress. And we're starting to work with governments, not on regulation, but we just announced in the UK. Uh, the government there is going to, if someone comes into a job center and has lost their job or lost their hours, say, well, have you thought about driving for Uber? We're on the central government website in India as a place for entrepreneurship. So we're, we're eager to work with cities on their transportation challenges and on their economic challenges. Okay, that's, that's interesting. I don't know if everyone's been following the news in Austin, but this week, Uber and other transportation network companies, including Lyft, shut down their service in Austin um, in a basically a standoff with the local government. If you say you actually want to be regulated, um, what is it going to take to fire that back up and make it work in Austin? Well, we were regulated in Austin. Uh, the types of regulations that we have in California, in Chicago, in many parts of South Florida now. So we were regulated. And then, you know, I think some city council people at the behest of the taxi industry tried to come in and, and add a whole bunch of barriers to entry that would essentially turn us into a taxi. So we had a referendum uh, that we lost. We're grateful for all the people who came out and voted. Now, the ballot language, I think the Austin American statesman described it as the bureaucratic equivalent of a triple or quadruple negative. When I first read the ballot language, I wasn't sure which way I was going to vote. So this was not on the level, um, but we figured we'd fight uphill battle, try and see if we could win the election. We didn't. So now we see service as has Lyft. And at the end of the day, you think about a city like Austin, uh, I think probably three quarters of our drivers drive two, 10 hours a week or less. A lot of artists, a lot of writers, a lot of people looking to piece together income. And you've got the University of Texas. And the impact on reduction of DUIs has been tremendous. So we're hopeful over time uh, there'll, there'll be a way back into the market, which we think is very important. But that's important. There's a principle here. If you establish too high a barriers to entry, you're not going to have enough drivers. So in Houston, Texas, where we have said if the regulations don't change, because there are very burdensome regulations, Lyft does not operate there. Why? Because basically, we're having to operate like a taxi company. So in Houston, Texas, which is the fourth biggest city in the world, in the United States, it's the only city we cannot meet demand at bar closing time. Can't get close. So too many people are still driving home. And we probably have a quarter of the drivers we should. Why? If you ask somebody to go through eight or nine different hoops, take time off work, it's basically got to be a career for them. And that's not ride sharing. And so that most of the regulations around the world that have passed understand that. And they enshrine in law things like insurance, safety, financial requirements. But they also understand they want to keep the barriers to entry low so that if somebody says, I just need to make a little bit of extra money for two or three months, driving a few hours a week, they can do that. If you ask them to jump through too many hoops, they're not going to be able to do that. Do you, you invested heavily in lobbying in Austin. Um, the reports of you know, estimated spending from Uber and Lyft over $8 million for this local issue. Did your lobbying efforts backfire there? 
Well, first of all, I mean, we weren't able to convince the council. We tried hard to basically stick with the regulations that were working. So this wasn't a situation where we weren't regulated or there was a problem to be solved. Uber and Lyft were flourishing in Austin. Many of you have probably taken it down there. Been a, been a huge, uh, I think, positive contributor to the economy and the transportation situation. In the campaign, we just started off in a deep hole. We had ballot language that was unfair, that again, when I saw it, uh, you know, uh, I was like, well, what side should I vote on? So it was written, I think, to, to basically preordain an outcome. And we had a huge hole in terms of education, because a lot of the rhetoric coming out would suggest that we weren't currently doing background checks. I think we've done 50,000 background checks in Austin alone. Do you have any so. plans to change those background checks? You, you bring up the background checks. I know cities are very concerned about safety, so are passengers, drivers as well. What are you doing in terms of making Uber service safer? Right. Well, first of all, we know from our research, one of the prime reasons people use Uber is they feel safe using so. So let's talk about the entire safety circle. First of all, there's what happens before the ride, which is background checks. No background check is perfect. We do background checks here in the U.S. at the federal, county, and state level. Driving record background checks. Zero tolerance policy on DUIs, unlike a lot of four-hire vehicles. So we do all we can to make sure that people who shouldn't be driving aren't. And we reject a lot of people. So in Austin, a third of the taxi drivers and limo drivers who've applied to re drive on Uber, we rejected because they didn't pass our background check. That being said, no background check's perfect. The big advantage that we and services like it bring is what happens on the ride and after the ride. Your GPS track the entire time. There's no anonymity. You know who the driver is, you know, and, the, and the driver knows who the rider is. You're able to share your ETA. When something does happen, there's no citywide manhunt for somebody based on the T-shirt they're wearing or the radio station they were listening to. Law enforcement has information to everything that happened on that trip. So this is something that we believe to be very safe. Consumers have clearly spoken. And the reduction in terms of DUIs has been pronounced. I mean, I think the state of Virginia said in one year alone, they've had over a 33% drop in DUI arrests in one year. There's a massive behavior change going on with millennials. So if you're under 30 and you live in a city with ride sharing, you don't even think about getting in a car and driving yourself or with someone else if you're going to drink. You don't even think about it, much less, than, much different than my generation. And by the way, the most of the safety incidents we see are actually not the driver, it's rider on driver. And this is a, and some of that can just be verbal abuse, but think about that. The driver now has the ability to rate the rider. And we know if there's an incident, who that rider was. So many reasons, one of the main reasons that drivers like driving on our platform is they feel that there's a quality. It's not just their behavior that's on trial. The rider also, and there's a sort of a degree of mutual respect that rises out of that. This is, is this the same background check? Is that applied across all of Uber services, Uber Eats, Uber Pool? the same background check? Right, so it's the same background check. And Uber Pool is basically UberX. By the way, one thing I want to talk about, how many of you here have used Uber Pool? In the New York market? Wow, well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, Uber Pool didn't exist about a y 16 months ago. We started it in San Francisco, and from a technology standpoint, it didn't work particularly well. Uh, you know, what we do is really hard. It looks easy just to make sure, you know, you get in the backseat of the Prius and the ETA is right. Uh, and that the billing works, but to add a second rider to that. So for those of you didn't, that don't use it, you can opt in to share a ride. So if I'm going from here to the back of the ro room, and the gentleman here in the front row is as well, we can opt to share a ride. 40% less expensive. So in about 16 months now, from one city, San Francisco, where the tech was challenging, today uh, we can announce that 20% of our rides globally are carpooled. 20%. In San Francisco, it's 50%. In LA, it's 30%. What does that mean? It means that you're making transportation more affordable and more people. What's the number one reason, according to a recent Harvard study, that people stay trapped in poverty? It's actually not crime rates. It's not test scores. It's the inaccessibility and cost of transportation. We have an inequality in our transportation system. So something like Uberpool makes it affordable to all income spectrums. But then you have more people in fewer cars. And the emissions reduction that you get out of that and the congestion reduction that you get out of that. So I'm old enough to realize or remember, we talked about carpooling in the 70s during the OPEC oil crisis. It's going to be the answer. It's never worked on scale. And you see this marriage with technology now making it in physical assets like cars. It's working. So Uberpool is something we're super excited about. But that's basically the core UberX experience, but you're sharing a ride. I want to come back to this question about what you think the company needs to change now. Um, is there what about tipping? Right. Well, uh, no. I mean, as part of the settlement recently, we clarified that tipping is permitted, obviously. 
But we think on both sides of the marketplace, the simplicity of, of the payment system works. But we are making some changes. At the same time, when we had the settlement recently, uh, we had a blog post from our CEO, Travis Kalanick, who said, we always haven't done everything we could as well as we could for drivers. So today is an example. So today, here in New York City, uh, I, we were joined by the Machinist Union, and we announced uh, the first independent driver's guild. So the Machinist Union here is going to represent Uber drivers in things like deactivation. So if somebody gets barred from the platform, they now can have an appeals process, and they can have a representative of the guild there. There'll be monthly meetings with Uber management. Uh, there'll be some initial benefits that the guild provides. And if we level the playing field here in New York, so we pay, and the Lyft pays 8.75 uh, sales tax on every ride. Taxis only pay 50% surcharge on every ride. So we're paying almost probably double if you average it out. If we could get equity there, the guild could then have a benefits pool and offer benefits like paid time off. So we, look, we know there's more we can do here. We just announced recently uh, a pilot, uh, which we hope will work, which is if you're a driver, you're now going to start getting paid after two minutes if you're waiting. We heard from a lot of drivers. It wasn't fair that they had to wait up to five minutes. Uh, they've also asked, it'd be great if we can accept a trip uh, as our other ones ending, because if you're in a car for an hour, you want to have a fare in the back seat as much as possible. So we're piloting that product change. In Seattle, Washington, we just announced uh, a couple of weeks ago, we're going to have uh, any driver that gets deactivated from the platform, that will be reviewed by a panel of their fellow drivers. So there's a lot we can do uh, and improve on. Um, a lot of them are in the product space uh, and, and make that a better, you know, the, our goal is to, if you turn on that app and turn on that car, to have somebody in the backseat as much as possible. We're, we're experiencing, uh, experimenting with, with payment on demand. So if you're out there and you make $50, a lot of our drivers have said they don't want to wait till the end of the week or two weeks. They want to get paid that day. So we're trying to listen a lot more uh, and improve um, what is already a very good opportunity and bargain for drivers, but strengthen that. I'm wondering if you see more similarities or contrasts between the sort of bubble of politics in DC and the tech bubble of Silicon Valley. Well, it's interesting. Um, this won't make me maybe particularly po uh, popular in my new home, but one observation I have is that there's now three sort of centers of influence and power in the United States, New York City, Washington, and Silicon Valley. And I think all of them sometime are a little de too detached from what's happening in Marshalltown, Iowa. And I think we have to guard against that um, and really understanding how most people are living their lives. But, so, but I do think, I, I mentioned this, but I, I want to dwell on a little bit. The difference in Washington, I'm so proud of what's been accomplished over the last eight years by the Obama administration. Against all odds, in the teeth of a recession, uh, with Congress not operating as it should. That being said, everything's too hard. Uh, there tends to be, when a new idea emerges, a very pessimistic response to that, why it can't work, why the politics are bad. Uh, and, and, and in the Bay Area, it's just completely different. Very much the orientation is positive, yes, we can. Uh, very much focused on problem solving. Uh, and so I think that's very healthy. But I think, I think those three centers need to understand. And I do think we're helped a little bit at Uber because even though we're a technology company, we're enabling gritty economic activity on the ground in cities. So it's hard for us to be disconnected from Des Moines and disconnected from Grand Rapids, Michigan. But I do think it's important to understand. I mean, there's some people in, in Silicon Valley who will say, why would we ever build a home with a kitchen anymore or a driveway or a garage? Well, maybe someday that'll be an appropriate question, but it's not right now. And so I think there has to be an understanding of how. And I do think we see in our politics, why is Trump doing so well? Why has Sanders done so well? A lot of reasons, but there is a lot of economic anxiety out there. Populism's on the rise, and I think we all need to understand that. I, I just have a few seconds left with you here, but I did have to ask, do you think it's easier to raise money for a startup or a political campaign? <laughs> Well, the, the, the checks are certainly larger for a startup. <laughs> um, no, I think it's interesting. I, I don't know how much similarity there is, but um, in politics, you're asking people who are really busy to give you time and who don't have a lot of extra money to give you money. So yes, there's wealthy people contributing to politics. But as you see with the Sanders campaign, we see in the Obama campaign, there's also a lot of hardworking people out there who might just give 20, I think he uses the word $27. So they have to feel passionate. They have to believe in your mission. They have to believe in your chances of success. And I think the same thing is true uh, on the business side. Uh, and you've got to show people how you're going to succeed. So in a campaign, if you can't tell potential donors or supporters how you're going to win the election, even if they believe in what you're talking about, you're not going to get a lot of, uh, I think, contributions. Same thing on the business side. Uh, and that you can be durable. 
and I think you have to really understand that when people invest in your company or in your political campaign, they are shareholders, even if you're not a public company. And so you deserve to keep them abreast of what's happening. One thing I made a mistake in the Obama campaign was sometimes thinking our grassroots volunteers and contributors, well, they didn't really want to know about this strategy or that strategy. And in fact, they wanted to know everything because they were deeply invested in it. They didn't want to read about it in the New York Times. They want to they want to know about it. So I think there is some commonality, uh, but you know, very different in terms of the structure. Thanks for spending your time with us. No, oh, thanks for having me, Laura. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.